Broadcasting live, this is KMA Talk Radio. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of fine cigars. With your hosts, Honest Abe and Adam K. the Brewmeister. Listen to the show anywhere in the free world at kmatalkradio.com. I like to smoke them like the Winston Churchill. Good morning, loyal listeners, libertarians, lovers of the leaf, everyone out there in Facebook land. Welcome to another exciting edition of KMA Talk Radio. Uh, quarantined, but still trying to get out. We the told you hopefully. three weeks ago, stop calling it quarantine edition, all right? <laughs> three weeks ago. Three. <laughs> three weeks ago, we had this discussion. And you did it last week, and I told you I was going to let it slide. We're not in quarantine anymore. Stop calling it quarantine edition. How about <laughs> it's the uh, broadcast by yourself edition? Anything else? You can you can make it up as you go Fine. along. Fine, I'll make it up as I go along. That's what we're gonna do. Uh, welcome to another exciting edition. I am Adam K. The Brewmeister. With me, of course, as always, the always amenable Mister Honest Abe. <laughs> Good morning. And uh, once again, live from New York. It's Paul DeGracco. Hey, and I have a, a New York City uh, uh, skyscape. What do you call this? I don't know. Whatever, whatever it's called. A mug I, today, to you know. Coffee yeah. mug. Yeah, coffee mug. My my uh, my KMA cup is in the dishwasher. My every time I drink water out of it, my mother-in-law puts it in the dishwasher. She's awesome. So I, I have someone who takes care of you, Paul. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. I, my wife is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, mm-hmm. the state of Florida is in uh, another emergency state. Have you have you followed the order to where? Because you're in technically in a place where you're supposed to be wearing a mask now, in theory. But do yes. you do you when you go into the stores now? Are you wearing a mask? Uh, yeah, you have to for thanks to the wonderful people of the county of Palm Beach. Everybody has to wear a mask anytime you're out in public or going into a public place. I I really don't want to get in this whole mask thing. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of just looking at it. I'm tired of reading on it in social media. Um, And we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. So I I really don't want to waste time on masks. I just wanted to see if Adam was doing it because he he wasn't doing it before. So I just wanted to see if maybe he'll just take the fine. Just as a courtesy to everyone else. Look, okay. everywhere I've been, they've had signs up, you know, do the new ordinance. Everyone, all employees and customers must, must, must wear a mask. And I'm telling you, every time I walk in, including the hotel I'm in right now, none of the clerks are wearing masks. Well, I'll, where what? you are what? is one of the areas where they seem to not uh, The care gas station it. right by our house, Paul. Stop stop trying always being anti-Abe, all right? <laughs> The gas station right by our house, sign right on the door the first day of the ordinance. I walk in, neither clerk behind the counter is wearing a mask. Wow. Look, look, you don't you don't you don't even need to argue about the effectiveness or whether you believe a mask is safe or not. But what you can what, what any rational, reasonable person has to be able to admit is the effectiveness of a mask is only as good as the person following protocols to keep that mask effective. Right? I've seen people putting masks on their seat next to them in restaurants, touching their faces with their mask, adjusting their mask, wearing the mask below below the nose. I had a guy really debating me about how important a mask was who had a beard this long. Right? So it's not doing anything. No. So, I mean, the fact that the human race, most 90% of them won't be able to follow a protocol that really makes a mask effective. It's just all pointless. So let's not waste time on that topic today. There we go. So yes, uh, are you enjoying your hotel stay? We'll discuss that. Eh? Well, I mean, actually, yeah, we came up to uh, Pensacola, actually a small area just outside of Pensacola called Utomit. And um, this is where my wife's family is from. Um, and I mean, this is like, you know, people forget, but this is they realize that most of America is kind of like this. I mean, it's kind of a little taken back to the 60s, right? 
really small town out here and it's uh everybody's been super nice everybody's been great and uh got to see my mother-in-law i'm from my mom uh my wife's father's side who i haven't seen probably maybe once after we got married so um yeah it's been a cool experience and the kids like it they're out in the country my son was running around the woods like uh tarzan like uh What's the kid from uh, the Jungle Book? Unless they banned that already. Mowgli. Are they banned that yet? Yeah. No. They've been, around like, they've been running around like Mowgli all day. All, all yeah, day they just did the live action version last year, if I'm not mistaken. Two yeah, it's been ago. good. Oh. So I was concerned whether I was concerned whether we have a decent Wi-Fi here, but it seems to be working good. So I'm happy to be here this morning. There we go. Excellent. And Paul, what have you been up to in New York? Uh, we were we've we've been. Not really socially distancing. I'm not gonna lie. Since we got here, so we've uh, we're we're where we are. We're staying at my mother-in-law's house, but it's less than five miles from my parents' house. So we've kind of been daily dropping back and forth between the two houses. I have an office set up at both at both places so that I can work from home. And uh, we had the baptism here, as we talked about last week. And I, I think we might be doing some kind of socially distanced July 4th party. So it would all be outside, you know, not, not like 100 people or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of doing outdoor activities so that we can keep Axel busy. Um, Are you going to be quarantined when you come back? I guess we have to, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know when we're coming back, I'll be honest, because we took the dogs knowing that we might stay a while. So we might be up here a week or two more than we I thought. I mean, honestly, I, honestly, you guys should just move back. Oh, God, no. I, I, I mean, I'll tell seriously. you what. The one reason why I wouldn't move back is because of the uh, the state income tax. <laughs> I, I'd, 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 lose, I'd lose 20% of my salary at this point if I had to pay the New York state income tax again. I've been teased so for so many years. What, what's the extra 500 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, from KMA. <laughs> <laughs> Not even. Yeah, no. Not even. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're just, Adam, we're just hanging out here, man. Like, it's it's been great to have, you know, my mother-in-law and the rest of the family around here so that we can, like, you know, have give the baby to somebody, you know, and they, they can hold <laughs> the baby for 20 minutes while we're, like, feeling human again. Yeah, pass around that coronavirus hockey puck. Nah, we wipe, we wipe them down. Here you go. Here, Nana, hold this. Oh, hold him. There you go. It's only the family. Sure it is. Take you're the line back. You're telling me that you're socially distancing where you are? I'm not. I'm not feigning that I. Well, I mean, I don't know. What? Are you, um. Are you kissing I'm and not, hugging hello? No. No, my my mother-in-law, who I people who's my mother-in-law has got to be like eighty something, mid late eighties. So yeah, I'm not messing with her, man. I gave her like an elbow bump from far away. There you go, Grandma. Wow. But but she was accustomed to it because when we we walked in, she kind of had it out. So you know, I mean, listen, there are people who are hugging out there. I see them, whatever. But I ain't hugging nobody. Did Did your wife hugging people? Um, not that I saw, but she might. I mean, who knows? I'm not hugging my wife, so who cares? And then one other question. Well, you're not hugging your wife, but you're in a hotel room. So is there only one beds, bed? Queens. <laughs> Two queen beds. Wow. All right. Two queen. But I'm not. I didn't get the queen beds because of the the coronavirus. I mean, I know reality, not because of the coronavirus, but do you always get two queen beds if you share a hotel? No, with that's your just wife? what was available. That's just what okay. was, this is what was available. Or make sure they at least have a couch. For Which, you as you on. know, the way I like to sleep, I'm totally okay with that. Well, I was, you know, what if they only have a king bed? Do you sleep on the couch? No, we we'll sleep. It's just not my. I don't need extra body heat within twenty feet of me when I'm sleeping. <laughs> I mean, basically, yeah. it's kind of like you're a single guy. Except you live uh, with somebody. You have a roommate. I, I, I really don't know why you emphasize on the fact that we refuse to sleep within six inches of each other, the basis of any kind of a healthy relationship. <laughs> We're both maybe asleep. Where does maybe, it matter? Maybe that's because that's all we have. I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't want to, I, I don't understand it. <laughs> well, anyway, Adam, it, it looks like you're doing well, Adam. That's, yes. That's how... Can't complain. 
So we have a, a pretty great guest on today. I know we do. Let's introduce our uh, Meet Your Maker for this week. We are pleased to welcome back once again to KMA Talk Radio, the one, the only, the man of his own domain, Mr. Steve Saka. Steve, welcome back, buddy. Domain. <laughs> If you could view upon my kingdom, you would realize what a crapola a situation it is. Well, I, you got, we were talking about it before the show, but you got this great backdrop behind you of these lovely purple bricks. Yes. Uh, you look like you know you're like in a dungeon of some kind. Dude, I'm preparing for my own hostage video. You know, I'm gonna make my own. <laughs> see how much I can. See how much my wife is actually willing to pay. I'm betting forty nine ninety five will be about the best I'm gonna get. Do you have today's newspaper ready to hold up in front of you? <laughs> it does. It does look like a hostage video backdrop now that you mention it. Yeah, you know that is an astute observation. Uh, well, that backdrop like appeared like during COVID video time. I mean, right. I hadn't seen it before, and all of a sudden, I mean, I remember his first couple ones. Like I think we were just against the white wall, and then all of a sudden the brick showed up. I'm like, oh, oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, a couple Nothing of the but interviews. The best for you, eh? Nothing but the best. <laughs> well, I, I have to imagine. I have to imagine that the video time and show time and the Zoom time is still at an all-time like dramatic high for you. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. There's something going on. Probably five out of seven days. Like I got two today. I got you guys, and then I'm doing one for my friends in Chicago tonight for their customers. So. You know, that's the first shop I bought a cigar from. You know, I, I love that shop. Uh, we're talking about Up Down Cigar, for anyone okay. that's curious. I mean, it's one of those legacy shops. It's an old yeah. town Chicago. Really cool. Great staff. Great people. And it used to be run by a woman named Diana Silvius Gitz. And honestly, she was a genuine broad in all the best ways you can say the word broad. Yep. <laughs> she was brassy, she was bold, she was one of the very rare people in, one of the rare women in the cigar business that was out at the front. I mean, she had her own brand that was made by Fuente. Um, she was a, she was a real during, power player. During the boom, too. Right. And, during and the boom. Right before the boom. I mean, she's, right. It, it's, it's a legit, legit shop, and it's it's maybe it's got a soft place in my heart, but it's arguably one of my favorite in Chicago. It really. Now is. you can't you can't you can't go in there and sit down and smoke. You no, can't even a, go, you can't even go in the humidor. Right. They they have the way it's set up. It's all cases. Most of the cigars are on the second level. The staff has to really help you, but that's kind of good too because they have real tobacconists that really figure out what right. you like, what you would want. You know, they help you, and then they have a patio out in the back. You know that they've set up now, so there is a place that you can smoke when you're there. They've done a really good job, but I mean, it's there's not too many stores like that left in America. I think there might be what 20, Have, 25 yeah. at most. I am. Um, I used to go there and grab a cigar before I would see a Second City show, which is down the block from there. Paul, you know what Second City is, right? Oh yeah, I've I've worked with a lot of guys that that uh, that worked at Second City. I did a lot of improv. Was, One of the guys I did the off Broadway show with. I was vetting whether you really had a theater career or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, not just a theater career. I had a. I had a. I had an improv career, man. Well, listen, in Second City, moreover, yeah. Listen, since I've been in New York, I've had two casting directors I used to work with call me to ask if I was back up here, and I'm like, I said to them, I was like, oh, how did you know? They're like, oh, your Facebook. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Have you seen the show that I'm doing? And they're like, no. <laughs> you see that I'm here, but you don't watch the show. <laughs> That's just funny. So, but, Steve, uh, how have you enjoyed being, you know, stuck at home for the last three months or so? Um, is, your, is your wife sick of you yet? Well, that that was true before the three months. So, we can get, <laughs> I've been married 36 years, so there's no way she's not sick of me. Um, you know, it's kind of weird. It's a mixed bag. I mean, it was nice to not travel as much and as relentlessly. Um, and it gave me a chance to catch up on a lot of things that I've been really on my to-do list since last year, but I'm still not even through it all. I mean, I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little antsy. I mean, I'd, I'd like to find some sort of balance between traveling some, doing some events and not doing as many, 
the biggest problem for me is just not being able to go to Nicaragua. That's a, that's turning out to become a real problem. It's pretty much thrown because I don't do things remotely when it comes to cigars and tobacco. I like to be there. So the things that they're doing that they're already doing, they're doing it. But I'm uneasy about it because I'm not doing my monthly inspection. So that makes me a bit uncomfortable. And there have been some things that have slipped through that I wouldn't have allowed to happen had I been there. And the other thing is a lot of the things that I was planning on doing in 2020 are not getting done because I can't physically be there to do it myself. And so that's throwing a bit of a kink in things. And every month they just keep delaying the travel ban. Um, You know, basically we get to the last week of the month and it's supposed to lift on the first. And then they say, oh, we're going to go another month. Right now it's supposed to end at the end of July, August 1st. But wait, June, supposed to end on July 1st. See, I can't even keep track of the months. But right now, uh, Nicaragua is actually probably at the peak of their uh, COVID cases. They're actually having a real problem. Um, But it doesn't get reported in the media because Nicaragua is like so many other third world countries. There's no COVID in Nicaragua. It's all pneumonia. You know what I mean? So, yeah, they they don't even have testing. I mean, I'm sure there's testing. Really? Well, they, they should do what this government does and just start paying the hospital uh, 30 grand for every uh, COVID and it'll all become COVID overnight. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I, I, let me say this. When the when the travel ban gets lifted, regardless of the circumstances, I'm going to have to go down there even if I have to be in a full hazmat suit because I, I need to go. Do they make them that big? Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll get some happy bags. I would pay some good money if you can send me get a photo of you in a full hazmat suit in Nicaragua. <laughs> Have they ever seen a hazmat suit? Will they think like aliens landed if you showed up in a hazmat suit in your factory? I'd be shot on sight. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, can you, know, you know, look, we always have problems with seasonal flu in all of these cigar factories because you're in close quarters. Right. You know, it's a lot of people. And so oddly enough, this isn't a situation that isn't something that they're kind of used to dealing with. You know, it's not uncommon to lose 30 percent of your workforce during a couple months in the winter, because if the flu takes on, if it catches hold in your factory, it just spreads. So they actually most of the factories kind of have hand sanitizers, washing stations. They tend to have plans to distance the people out. This is a little bit more severe than normal, but it isn't something that they're completely oblivious to. So they've been, you know, in Nicaragua, they never officially closed any of the factories. They just kind of spread them out a little, you know, to try to make it, you know, safer for the workers. Now, you got a lot of projects going on on the table. For a guy who wasn't able to get down in Nicaragua, you, your plate is without a doubt full. Yeah, most of the new stuff though that you're seeing is been in the works for a while. Right, it was all stuff that was really done last year. So like, I have Sober Mesa Blue, which is a tweaked version of Sober Mesa, um, and because of C19, everything got delayed, and the packaging got delayed, and you know because printer was out of commission for four months and then the paper maker was out of commission the powder maker was out of commission the ink guy was out of commission so what's happened is the cigars that i thought i was going to be selling like in march i'm now lucky if i'll be selling them in august the good side to that is now all the cigars are a year old so i'm just going to make that part of the part of the deal that sober mesa blue will always be aged a full year you know so in some weird way Maybe it worked to my advantage. Um, but yeah, most of the stuff that's actually, most of the stuff that everyone knows is coming is something that was already either made in 2019 or was something that production was started on um, at the very tail end of the year. Because my last physical visit to Nika was in February. So if, if it was kicked off then, but I just have a real, I just can't bring myself to, through email or phone call. Look, I'm talking to them every day, but I just can't bring myself to, it's not part of who I am as a company. I mean, what I do is because I'm involved. Now, whether that's good or bad, whether it makes a difference or not, 
that's all debatable, but it's just part of it's part of my shtick, I guess. So it's just, it's not just, who you are as a person. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So, so I want to I want to talk about one in particular, um, the Saka's taste for yourself mm-hmm. sampler, right? <laughs> now that that wasn't that wasn't an old project. That, that 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 to me that looked like something you like dawned upon yourself driving at two a.m. somewhere and saying. You know, I mean, how did that project come about, really? I'll tell you what it was. So last year when I launched Brulee and the whole controversy about whether it's Sweet Tip, not Sweet Tip, came up. Um, was it a controversy? I think so. I heard something about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, look, I'm a cigar geek. And so I said to the factory, you know what? Make me some samples that are single Sweet Tip. Make me some samples that are double Sweet Tip. Here's how I want you to do it. Because it's not like I don't know how to make a sweet tip cigar. I mean, I was president of Drew Estate, for God's sakes. You know, <laughs> They're in my wheelhouse. I know how to do it. So I had them make a bunch of samples. And then I kind of smoked them for myself. And, you know, because it was just kind of a curious, stupid kind of thing. And, um, and honestly, the single sweet tip, I actually think would be very sellable. The problem is I don't think consumers would buy my style at my price point quality to then have it sweetened. But that's an easy so the conversation just kept coming up, coming up, coming up. And I find like, you know what? Let me make some money at this. You know, it's more of a marketing thing. I mean, I've already done it, you know. So just tell the factory, hey, make some sweet tip, make some double sweet tip, make some regular brulees, and we'll put them in a five pack. We'll label them with bands and not tell anyone which ones are which. And let's just put them out there and see what people think and see if they can even figure out which is the sweet and which isn't the sweet, which is the double sweet. And it was one of those dopey things that I did it kind of tongue in cheek, thinking, what, I'm going to sell 300 of these maybe, you know, and it turned out we sold like over 3000 of them. It's crazy. Um, So it's going to be interesting. Um, You know, we're going to get them in. People are going to get to try them. And And I've always said to people. I think a lot of people that think it's sweet tip, they don't have a comparative standard because they don't smoke Baccarat. They don't smoke Coast. You know what I mean? And not that there's anything wrong with those cigars. They're just not my consumers. So I think when they have a head-to-head comparison, it'll become even clearer. But the reality is it won't. It'll just add to the controversy, add more fuel to the fire. (laughs) And ultimately, that's good for me too because if that's what motivates someone to try Sober Mesa Brulee, then fantastic. Plus, I also get to label a product, you know, STFU. You got to love a business where you can do that. You know? Right. You know, poke some fun, you know, enjoy it. it it's going to be interesting, but I don't um, I don't see I, – I really doubt that there's any future beyond this this sample. Right? I just can't wrap my brain around someone buying a, a Davidoff quality, you know, Connecticut shade cigar and then wanting it with a sweet tip. That just – I can't. But I've been wrong about a lot of things in the past. And these are these are looking to drop sometime next month. Um, yeah, I think that they're going to drop sometime. Probably, uh, it'll probably be closer to the first week of August. That's the only thing, you know. The label says the reveal date is September fifteenth, but if it turns out I don't get them in early enough, because look, logistics are a mess right now as far yeah. as shipping. You know, I've had things delayed five weeks. I literally had a shipment that got no delay just last week. I have I have unstolen valors coming four weeks earlier than I expected them to come. It's just so up and down right now. But if they don't come on time, I will post, I will delay the reveal. I want to make sure that the retailers that bought them, their consumers at least have three weeks to smoke them, try them, debate about it, bust my balls about it, you know. Your balls, your balls tend to be the focus of a lot of busting. Yeah, I, I get a, my balls get a lot of love. It's kind of surprising. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm other, looking the forward other... to trying it myself. <laughs> I, I mean, I I really like the brulee, and I I honestly wasn't sure or not if it was a sweet tip. It didn't matter to me at all. So I, it'll be it'll be interesting for me to do a side by side comparison with some kind of palate cleanser in between, right, Steve? Is that should you should you have something to? The only, the only thing I'm concerned about is that if someone's smoking them, if they smoke one, they smoke the other, and they smoke a sweet one first, then it's going to impact the next one they smoke. Right, that's yes. what we were saying. So, so I do think that 
a palate cleanser would be smart in between. And, and look, there are three different versions in five cigars. And I'm not saying how many are double, how many are single, and how many are not. I'm just guaranteeing that at least one of the five will be one of the three varieties. Okay. Um, but I, it's like I said, this is a this is a this is a total crap show. Who the heck knows what's going to result? I don't even know that I care. It's just kind <laughs> of stupid and fun, and you know, it's just it just speaks to my inner cigar geek. And you know what? I get to make a little money while smiling. And my and a lot of my retailers are doing a special STFU events where, you know, they bought 25 of them. They're going to do an event for 25 people. They're going to serve Cinnabons and Swedish Fish and, you know, Shirley Temples. And they're going to they're going to play the whole thing up. You know what I mean? So they're going to make it into something fun for their guys and girls that visit their shops. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the experience. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, an- another project that see- you're working on, which seems to really uh, people are talking about, is the, I mean, since we're on the brulee, is the brulee blue. Yeah. Yeah, brulee blue is kind of a it's a thousand box initial limited production. Just um, it's just me slightly tweaking the blend making it more in a connoisseur kind of size. It's kind of a thick Lonsdale format. Cigars are aged a full year. I don't really, I mean, it'll be really good, but it's hard for me to envision it being as popular as the regular Toros or Robustos. You know what I mean? Um, but look, I, there's so many things I'm wrong about. I mean, like I'm smoking an Unstolar Valor now and before we got on the air, um, I think Adam asked me, is it your most popular selling one ever? And honestly, it's selling great, but it isn't. The number one current seller out of Muester de Saka is the Now Leave Me the Hell Alone Lancero. I would have never, ever guessed that. You know what I mean? The fact that the Lancero would be the number one, and Abe can speak to this as a retailer for decades, how unlikely that is to be is beyond unlikely. Right. So, you know, it's you have ideas, you think this is the way things are going to go. But in the end, consumers are the ones that pull the trigger. So, you know, it's it's hard to really ever know how things are going to fly. Right. I, we've said it on this show maybe a thousand times that everybody talks about Lanceros, but nobody ever really buys them. But apparently this is one of those one in a million chances where it actually happened. I, I, think, right. the, I think the more accurate statement is, the ratio of chatter and talk versus actual sales is disproportionate. Yes. It's not that nobody ever buys them. I, I'm a Lancero smoker, right? right? I, but, but, but it's just the proportionate of, uh, we think the amount of chatter and people who say they love it and say it's their size or whatever. And then you go to other retail stores, not just ours, and you look at the sales, it's just extremely disproportionate. Right. And I think for a lot of Lancero guys, They're in love with the format of a Lancero. They don't tend to be brand or blend loyal. What they tend to do is they tend to buy a whole box of whatever the new Lancero is, smoke one or two, put it on their shelf, talk about how great it is for the next decade, but they never buy another box. You know what I mean? They're moving on to the next Lancero. So it's kind of the general pattern. Now, look, that's a stereotypical Lancero purchaser. There's exceptions to that, obviously, as there is with everything. But they're very seldom a repeat purchase kind of item. Most manufacturers make a few hundred boxes. They sell those few hundred boxes, and then that's the end of it. I'm I'm literally into – I'm probably bumping up close to 10,000 boxes of those damn Lanceros at this point. And that's really – that's really surprising. Wow. I, Is there yeah. a particular place that, that buys more Lanceros than, than another, like a particular region or state? No, you know, the way it works with all cigars, it has a lot to do with the shop. Right. If a shop's owner is a big Lancero guy, if the clerks and staff that work in the shop are really into a certain blend or a certain size, those shops it does particularly well with. You know, having a having a champion on the ground that interacts one-on-one with a consumer does something that I could never, ever do. So right. that's where you see you know, products, you know, really do better than in other places. And, you know, and over time, as they become more established, because of those champion shops, 
it then broadens your base and you now sell a lot more cigars in a lot of other stores that don't do that one-on-one style of interaction. Right, right. Yeah, everybody sells differently, I'm sure. Up here, they uh, there's there's not you can't go into shops and sm- I mean in New York you can. There's a lot of shops where you can go in and smoke, but the the cigar shops in my local area here that I've gone into, it's it's like a ghost town right now. I mean, there even though Long Island is considered, I think they they said I know Abe doesn't like me to mention the news, but they said it's contained here in theory. So they're moving to the next phase. Um, there's, there's nobody hanging out in cigar shops here. I went to the two local ones here. There was nobody there in in shops, uh, in Babylon. There's two, there's two shops right here in Babylon village and, uh, haven't seen anybody there, but, uh, I have a nice selection though. I gotta say it's, it's nice now to come back to my old cigar shops after doing the show for so many years and see some of the brands that I, I now recognize after doing the show for so long. Uh, in the shops that I used to frequent when I was much more limited in my palate. But uh, it would be nice to have that experience again. I mean, the bad thing for you in New York is your your tax is going up significantly. Yeah. Month, I think in the month of September, right? Mm-hmm. It's going back Yeah, I mean, up I'll, be, I'll be back in Florida by then. I mean, Hopefully. And honestly, for the people listening to the program right now, buckle up. These taxes are going to get crazy. All of these states are all hurting for money as a result of what's happened. And tobacco tax is always like number one tax for them to to target in on. And we're going to see a lot of regret. I think we're going to see regretfully a lot of tax proposal increases and even worse, a lot of them pass. I I just I hope I'm wrong. I'd love to be wrong about that, but I don't think I'd be. In that same vein, Steve, you know, uh, that came out this week that substantial equivalency and filing with the FDA is not going to get pushed back at this point by September. Are you ready for that? And have you how have you prepared at this time? So here's the funny part. I actually kind of took that as good news. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you why. Because the court was actually asking the FDA. The court, the D.C. District Court has a major court hearing coming up on substantial equivalency in the month of July. And what the court was saying to the FDA is, hey, we really suggest that you would delay this. Okay, which kind of gives you some indication as to the way the court is thinking if they're recommending the agency delay. The agency came back and said they're not going to delay. Now, this gets very confusing because it also ties into a Maryland court decision that kind of ties their hands, not allowing them to delay without a lot of legal hurdles. I think what this means is we are finally possibly going to actually get a decision about what's going to happen with substantial equivalency. Now, the date's hard. The court date's hard. The court asked for the date to be delayed. The FDA denied it. So the court's going to hear the case. So I am optimistic. I don't know how it's going to go. We're talking about people that wear pajamas to go to work. Who knows? But I like (laughs) the fact that it's finally going to come to a head. Now, to answer your question, am I ready? No, I'm not 100% ready. Will I be ready? Yes. I'm engaged with a real FDA tobacco compliance law firm. We were waiting to see if there was going to be this delay. There isn't. So we will have all our filings in on time. The problem is, will they be perfect? No, because the FDA has never generated any guidance telling us how to do these. So everybody's kind of doing their own kind of thing. But what will end up happening is they'll be on file. It will basically give me allowed to be in the marketplace up until they make some sort of determination on those filings. Now, given what they did with the ingredient disclosures, they did nothing with those. We submitted those like 18, 20 months ago. Never heard one word, one peep, nothing. Uh, they didn't. They just they said, yep, we got them. Thank you for submitting them. You know what I mean? And I have a feeling, given the fact that the FDA has already put in print in the Federal Registry, that we are the lowest priority and they're not going to enforce, I have a feeling that's where these are gonna go too. Okay, so the sad part is for a company my size, I mean, I'm gonna spend about 100K to do filings that probably won't matter, but will make me legal. Yeah, it's kinda, it's a sad situation. And and sadly for the listeners on this program, that 100000 that comes out of my pocket, somehow that ends up added into the cost of the cigars. Everybody's cigars on the shelf today, they cost between a dollar to a dollar fifty more 
because of the Tobacco Control Act. Current, of course. Of course. And those prices are going to continue to go up the more of this that happens. And, 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 and then we hate it because it doesn't do anything to make the product better. Right. Doesn't make do anything to make consumers better. Doesn't do anything to improve public health. Doesn't do anything to prevent you smoking. It really is nothing but a tax to fund a bureaucracy. That's all it is. And it, as the user fees, which are static, if imports go down, right? Right. Or which is something. To, and I talked to you about this briefly on the phone. Right. Three years ago, my average user fee was about four and a half cents. The way it works is it's like a condo association. Right. Basically a fixed rate that, hey, to maintain the building, we need so much money a year. So if you've got 500 tenants in the building, it gets divided between 500 people. If you've got three tenants in the building, those three people are screwed. So as cigar import numbers have been going down, okay, because of the slowdown in the economy, those user fees per portion per cigar have gone significantly up, Okay. And right now, talking to my TTB importer, he's kind of telling me, hey, prepare. You may end up spending as much as a quarter to 30 cents a cigar on your FDA user fee for Q2. That may be where it shakes out to be. Now, it's going to depend. Look, my TTB guy only sees the number of imports going through his channel. He doesn't know the numbers through the other channel. But if their channels are doing the same as his channel, then that's where I'm going to end up being. And what do I do with that? That's a lot of money. It's, you know, an extra quarter a cigar. And I know consumers are thinking it's no big deal. But, you know, on my end, a quarter ends up meaning a dollar to the consumer right, at the right. end of the register. And that's what mean making no profit on it. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's not it's not a good situation at all. Right. It's not like you're increasing your business because of this. No. I think you're actually you may be decreasing your business. You're you're pricing people out of cigars that they could otherwise smoke. They're right. they're being forced to smoke a a lesser grade, less price style product, you know, because of where the the dollars are going. And when you put it into a tax state like yours, the state of New York, that's going to go up to I think 75% wholesale. Well, that's another 75% on top of that. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's 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 it's, it's it's not good for anybody. It really isn't. Uh, not it's, the best. It's tough. So what have you been doing since you've been quarantining and, and, and working through your to-do list? Have you been doing a lot more fishing? Drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Eating. Are you, drinking, are you drinking this early in the morning? Dude. Or is that just near your desk? Just the fact that I have bottles within arm's reach right. Right. tells right. you how right. bad it is. So in addition to overindulging in the uh, fine brown spirits, um, I'm like a cow, man. I'm grazing nonstop. Yeah. Every time I pass through the kitchen, it's like another 100 to 200 calories. If I walk through the kitchen 30 times a day, I got 3,000 bonus calories. I, I, put on, I put on probably 40 pounds. Easy. It's terrible. I'm in that I'm in that 30 plus range, I think, without a doubt. Uh, yeah, it's just it's been nothing. But every day I wake up and say, I'm going to do better. And guess what I don't do? Better. I don't. And I say, I'm going to do better tomorrow. And I don't. It's it, I'm so pathetic on this. It really I'm just it's, it's it's just it's one of my it's one of my biggest personal failures, my inability to control my eating. It's, it's been a problem since I was a fat little kid at the age of eight, and it's continued to be as a fat, you know, bastard at the age of 55. Um, so I don't know. Were you, so you were, you were a big kid too? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, a, I was a chunker. I shopped in the husky section, man. Okay. You know? Yeah. No, I, uh, the only time in my life I've been thin was when I was probably in kindergarten, and then when I was enlisted in the Navy. Those have oh, been yeah, like the... Right. You were forced the, into that. Right. It was the only time. I've always I've always been a, a heavy guy. Always. Really? I did not know you were a Navy man, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, I enlisted squid. I enlisted when I was 17. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how long did you serve? Uh, six years. Oh, wow. And uh, would you, where, where were you deployed at? Or, uh, uh, I was stationed on uh, an old Knox class active duty frigate. FF-1056, the USS Canole. I was during the early years of the Reagan uh, era, 
So we were like seriously hazed, gray, and underway because that was when the Cold War was uh, growing to a peak and amping up, and we were trying to outspend the Russians, and they were trying to outspend us. And I spent I spent a lot of time at sea on that boat. I think on average we may have been home three months a year for four years. Oh wow! wow. And w- so, what's your best Navy story you've got? Oh, dude, we don't have time for that A and B. We can't do that on a, on a radio <laughs> program. <Are you> kidding? <laughs> that, 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 that's a question in an in-person event where I can read what the audience is reacting because I start telling stories like that, I'm going to end up uh, being boycotted and beheaded. We're not doing that here. <laughs> we're not doing that on a radio program. <laughs> that's funny. Were you smoking cigars when you were in the Navy? That's when I started really smoking cigars. Um, You know, I had a... A senior chief gunner that got me into it, and he smoked really shitty, bad, cheap bundle Maduro cigars. Yeah. And then my operations officer, Walter Laird, he just looked at me and he took pity on me and he said, "Come to my stateroom." And he, he's the one that gave me my first like real legitimate premium handmade cigar, and he kind of set me off on the path. Do you remember you know? what it was? Um. I'm not positive because you don't pay attention when you're that young. Right, right. I think it was it was I think it was a Romeo and Julieta. That's what I think it was. I think it was like a Romeo and Julieta Churchill. It was either that or it was one of the like a Fuente eight five eight or something like that. Mine was Royal Jamaica when it was still being made in Jamaica. I mean, I know because it, I, I purchased it. It wasn't given to me, so. Well, I- Look, I know the first box I bought. The first whole box I bought right, right. was a we box of uh, was a box of Fuente Hemingways. Oh wow! That was the first box. The whole box I bought. It was like in 1987, I think, was my first whole box purchase. And I even remember uh, I bought it on a store on FM 1960 in uh, north of Houston. Yeah. So yeah. I'm trying to see if I can remember what my first. Full box purchase. And a million dollars later, I'm still alive and still spending money on cigars. It's crazy. <laughs> right. Adam, what was your first box purchase? Uh, I think my first box purchase was actually a box of Romeo and Julieta Cubans that I bought in Canada when I was huh. there for a wedding. Yeah. So your first box purchase was a box of Cubans? Yes, but we had particularly bought Cubans previously at that time. Uh, I had a buddy who had a contact in Nicaragua that would send us Cubans every now and then. I think this is a great question. I think all our listeners should comment what yeah. the first box per- I know, know my first, first box, box purchase. purchase. What is it? Uh, my first box purchase was when I, I used to live uh, on the beach, on a private beach, and I remember uh, a cop buddy of mine gave me uh, an acid Cuba Cuba and I liked it and we were having a party. I was like, you know what? I'll buy a box of those. So I went and bought a box in Huntington. I think it was wow. Huntington. Yeah, it was, it was Huntington. I bought a box of, of acid Cuba Cubas. That was my first ever cigar box purchase. But, but I'm a guy too that likes to, I like variety. Like when I eat, I never like to eat the same thing all the time. So like I, boxes sometimes get wasted on me because I'll give most of them away, not because I don't like the cigar. It's more like I like to try as much as I possibly can. So I buy a lot of individual sticks or, or two or three sticks, and then I'll buy as much as a box sometimes with all different types of cigars because I always like to keep, especially doing this, I want to try as many cigars as I possibly can. And with the limited time that I have to smoke them with an infant at home and, a, and an almost two-year-old, I like to... I like to experience different things as much as possible, but it does suck when you do that because I have old faithfuls that I know I can go back to that I know I'm going to like this cigar. And when you get a cigar that you just don't really like, it sucks because now your your hour and a half that you have to, to smoke a cigar and enjoy, you're like, eh, it could have been better. <laughs> I I think I can't. I think my first box purchase. I I I, I don't know if it's my first one or the first one I can remember. The only reason why I question is because at that point in my life, I didn't, I don't, I don't remember having that kind of money to afford that kind of a box purchase. Right. But then again, the I'm, I'm going on what the price it is today. Back then, it was probably like six dollars a cigar, you know, five something maybe even. But um, my first box purchase I can remember is a Don Carlos number two. 
Wow. I still yeah. Don Carlos number twos. Michael uh, Michael Herklot said that his first box purchase was JR Alternative Bundle. <laughs> yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me. Well, actually, I mean, if we're going to talk really first box purchase, it was probably a box of money makers. You know what I mean? While I was still like really young in the Navy. Uh, I'm talking about my first like premium. Right. Yeah. I'm not like, counting the Swisher Sweets we used to smoke after football games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. So, but, uh, yeah, I think, you know, you know, I'm kind of getting the other way as I get older, I want to play the field less, which isn't good for a guy that is relatively has a small, young new company with new products in the marketplace to tell consumers. But the reality is I don't want to waste my time. I want to pick out things that I know I'm really going to enjoy. You know what I mean? I'm, and I'm that way about everything. I'm, I'm the point that Look, I go to certain restaurants because they make certain dishes the way I love them. And every time I walk through that door, I pretty much know what I'm buying. I'm done with a million craft bourbons. You know what I mean? I have enough that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need to play the field. Now, at the same time, I typically make I try every day to smoke one cigar from somebody else that I haven't had before. So yeah. that's yeah. hard, dude. Um, no, you know what'll end up at? Look, I smoke on average eight, ten cigars every day. So typically in the morning, my I first cigar, hard, yeah. I'll smoke something that I know I like because I don't want to ruin my morning espresso. And then <laughs> I'll go to my walk-in humidor and I'll pick out something that I haven't had and I'll, I'll light it. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I only make a half inch into it and I pitch it. You know, um, other times I smoke the thing all the way through. But I, I still, my inner cigar geek makes me want to smoke it. And I know people think, oh, well, he does it for like business purposes, study the market, see what your competitors are doing. But that's not the case at all. I, I do it because I'm just, I'm genuinely interested. I see consumer, like if I see something that's getting a lot of social media traction that I see multiple people talking about, well, it makes me curious. I want to try that, see what that's about, see if I have the same experience. Thanks. So. Steve, how many cigars from other people would you say you currently have on hand right now? That's hard, of course. 20,000? Oh. oh, my God. At the house? Yeah. <laughs> um, scattered. Scattered. <laughs> scattered, but there's probably, in my walking humor, there's probably at least 10,000 of them. Wow. The house. How, yeah, I, how the hell do you make a decision? Well, look, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that get ignored, you know, Look, one of my biggest problems is things end up aging so long that they they become too smooth, too mild. You know what I mean? I look I when I left your estate, I left with like 7000 Liga Provadas. I smoked uh, number nine last night that was made in like 2008. Honestly, I didn't really enjoy it much. It was good. It was nice. It was impeccably made. The tobaccos were perfect. But, you know, over the last 12 years, it had just mellowed out so much that it kind of lost that pop, that zip that I really liked about the cigar. So that's part of my problem is that sometimes they just get overaged in my humidor. And I don't know what to really do with them. I mean, I give a lot of cigars away, um, but it's hard. You know, it's not I can't sell them because most of these cigars I have, I didn't buy, you know. I right. got them as gifts or, you know, you know, whatever. So I can't because people are all asking, well, why don't you sell your old Ligas? Because I have all the stuff from 2006 through 2013. But I can't bring myself to sell them because it's, it's just not right. I didn't pay for them. Right. And I did. And I worked there. So it was part of my compensation. But you know what I mean? It's not the same. Right. You know, so. Very true. Wow. So have you picked up any new hobbies or tried to advance yourself at all other than eating too much? Fishing. Fishing. He's fishing a lot. I've been, I've been fishing more, but the way it's been working is – so the thing that's nice about it is I can work all day, and then right around 4 o'clock I can say, huh, weather's nice. I'm at a good stopping point. Let me go out on the lake. It doesn't have to be a big deal. So, is this Lake Umbagad? Uh, no, that's too far. That would take me about okay. four or four and a half hours. I tend to fish closer to home. I fish a lot on uh, Lake Squam, which most – your older guys will know the lake. You remember that movie, On Golden Pond? Oh, yeah. yeah. I know. Henry, I know yeah. Jane Fonda, that's one of my favorite lakes. I go there all the time. 
and I can get there in about an hour from my house. So, you know, by 5.30, I'm in the boat, I'm on the water, I can fish till sunset. So I can leave my house at 4, 4.15 and be back at my house at 11 o'clock at night. So that works out well. And, you know, it helps not having to travel because, you know, it's weather dependent. It's right. schedule dependent. You know what I mean? So I have a lot more flexibility to just once or twice a week say, okay, I'm going to pop out at the end of the day and do this. So that's been nice. And what's the biggest fish you've caught at this point? In my life or what? That's a tough question. It depends. From on the lake? Yeah. Okay. In, in, in recent history. Oh, in recent history, here in New Hampshire, probably six pounds. The fish don't get very big, but that's in bass. You know okay. what I mean? Large mouth and small mouth bass. You know, I've, I've caught I've caught a 17 pound bass in Florida. You know, you know. So and I've caught and I've caught 180 pound tarpon. You know, also in Florida. So yeah. you know, just depends on where you are. But here, most of the species that I'm fishing for, which is primarily small mouth, they average between two and four pounds. Do you the prefer the Do you prefer the um, freshwater fishing over the saltwater fishing? I prefer technical light tackle fishing. So I like saltwater, but I like to do inshore, which means close to shore, like in the mangroves. So snook, redfish, you know, sea trout, you know, I like micro tarpon. I know everybody wants the big 180 pound tarpon out of government's gut. I'd rather go back to the Florida Everglades and catch the 20, 25 pound tarpon on light line and light tackle up underneath the mangroves flipping underneath those. So that's really, it's more the, the style of fishing than whether right. it be water or salt water. I'm not, I'm, so you prefer to deep sea fishing. Yeah. I find deep sea fishing. Look, deep sea fishing is great. You go out with your buddies, you drink beer, you tell jokes, you bust balls all day, but really. The, it's reeling. It's reeling. It's deep sea reeling. Right. The mates doing all the work. You jump up and you just reel and I don't know. It's not. Uh, we're it, we're on the, not fishing. It's a. Uh, it's we're an, on the same with friends. Do you do you uh, keep the out. fish or you do catch and release? I catch and release almost everything. Um, you know, look, I'll I'll occasionally keep a trout or two because um, pan fried trout is just absolutely delicious, a fresh rainbow. And if I'm down where you guys live. I'll keep a few mangrove snappers to make fish tacos or a fish sandwich out of. But literally, I would say 99% of what I catch goes right back in the water. I, I do it for sport. If I, if I want fish, that's why there's a restaurant. You know what I mean? I can go. <laughs> they're going to prepare it better than me anyway. So. Yeah, I'm in the same boat with you. I've always argued when I moved to Florida and people took me out fishing i'm like this is kind of just like deep sea reeling i call it reeling you know i mean but yeah i'm, I'm like you i'm not a big fishing guy uh, up in chicago we used to go up to wisconsin a place called fox lake a lot whatever but that's the kind of fishing i like too right you know look and where where you were you know you got walleye you got musky you got northern pike i don't have those species where i live but they would all be in my wheelhouse too right very cool well, we're going to take a quick break coming up at the top of the hour. A uh, quick word from our sponsor. But up ahead, we're going to have this, uh, William Cooper, um, Scar Coop, um, to talk about uh, what's going on this week. And we're going to touch base a little bit on that uh, that Donald Trump uh, Zoom in that uh, he was invited to. And also, oh, yeah. we got Joe Gro from Drew Estate. Um, uh, smoking had a great giveaway. Summer's here giveaway. We got a hell of a prize pack. You got that prize pack, uh, Paul? You got that graphic? I have but, the graphic. Um, we had all these cool people who po posted up these entries on social media with beach balls. There it is. With now. a smoking beach ball. Yeah, with a smoking beach ball. And they drew a state cigar with the hashtag Summer's here. And uh, Joe Grow will be coming on in hour two to uh, go over the finalists and pick an awesome winner of this prize. Uh, all ahead in hour two. Stay tuned. Keep it lit. Hey, everyone. Susan Giorgio here. Hi, this is Rich coming at you from South Florida. Hi, I'm Tom Stroud. Hey, it's Stephen Martin coming to you from Seattle, Washington. Hey, everybody. I'm Jennifer True. Hey, everyone. This is Alex Ryan. I'm a poker player, a dominoes player, a world traveler. I like to go sailing. Hit the golf course, 
and drink some wine. I am a mother, I am a content creator. I'm also a husband, a father, and someone who really enjoys great cigars. Enjoying a Monte Cristo, in fact, the 50th anniversary Monte Cristo, special limited edition. My favorite cigar, Monte Cristo Epic. Please take this opportunity to smoke one of our amazing Monte Cristo cigars. The Monte by Monte being my personal favorite. I am Monte Cristo. I am Monte Cristo. I am Monte Cristo. We, we are, are Monte, Monte Cristo. Cristo. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting edition of KMA Talk Radio, live on the Facebook. I am Adam K., the Brewmeister. With me, of course, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Honest Abe. Live from Pensacola. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, of course, live from New York, it's Paul DeGracco. I, I, I've never been to Pensacola. Is it is it worth traveling to if you don't have family there? Um. Well... I mean, listen, Pensacola Beach, I mean, there's like huge resorts and stuff mm. out there. Um, is some beautiful beach and a nice place. Definitely worth, you know, if you want just uh, I mean, you, you don't have to drive that far. I mean, there's, we got such stuff in Florida, South, South Florida's equivalent. But my wife's family is actually in a small town called Cantillment right outside of Pensacola. Okay. So, like, you know, we're like literally in like the heartland of America. You know, like... Um, Mid America means it's 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 quaint, you know. It's very quaint. It's a, it's a totally different vibe than the southeast Florida beaches. Oh you're, yeah, you're much more in the deep south. It's like being at the beach in you know Alabama, Mississippi. You know, I mean, they are the beaches are gorgeous in the Panhandle. They the further gorgeous. the further north you go, the more south, the more southern you are in in Florida. I find absolutely hundred and ten. Well, I mean, not just people wise too. I mean, it just uh, uh, environmentally, right? I mean, there's no palm trees up here. Oh, you know really? I mean? we, 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 well, it's not. It's prevalent. I mean, I'm looking out the window. I don't see a palm tree. It's it's more of that, you know, Georgia type. Lob lob palm trees. Right. Yeah. Well, technically, yeah. palm trees are not native to. You know, there's only like two species that are native to Florida. The rest were brought here because they look pretty. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. That was something kind I learned like when I moved to Florida. Kind of like, hey, you, Paul. I was going to say, I just said, like Paul. He's going to Florida because he looks pretty. He's not native to America either. Yeah. <laughs> hey, brought him because he's pretty. I don't know if the second half is true either, but hey. We'll take, we'll take it. We will take it. Uh, Paul will take any compliment he can get. That is true. I will absolutely. Um, so Steve, what, in, in your perspective, we don't want to, we don't like to, you know, dwell on the, the quarantine thing, but in, in your perspective, when do you, when do you think that, that your business will get more back to normal when you can start traveling again? And who knows? no clue. This is the most messed up year ever. Right. I, honestly, I could never have projected this ever happening. And I honestly don't even understand what's happening to us from a business point of view. We we have been very blessed. We had a really ugly March. We had an ugly beginning of April. But since then, things have been just gangbusters and on fire. Oh, wow. And, wow. I, and I, I hope that's true of all my peers in the business, too. But I don't think it is for some. And it's just it's such a topsy turvy year. And I have no clue. I would love for things to get back to normal, mm -hmm. but I can't even begin to think of, I mean, you got the economy, you got the COVID, you got the race riots, you got the presidential election. I mean, you got the FDA. I mean, this is the craziest year ever. I, I And every year I say, man, I can't wait till that year's over. If we end up with a year that tops this year, we are seriously in Mad Max apocalypse. Yeah. That's where I mean, I just don't even know how much more absurd or crazy or disruptive a year we could possibly ever have. Right. I mean, uh, at what point are we going to have escape from New York level uh, kind of 80s fun and excitement going on? Well, I can tell you <laughs> this. I mean, watching TV, I think some of these scenes look like they're out of the movie The Purge. I mean, it is crazy 
when you look at some of this video footage? I mean, it, uh, it, it's, you know, as long as they get rid of Congress first, when it happens, you know, <laughs> I'll be all right with it. You know, there was a guy, there was a video going around, I don't know if we saw it, but it's a guy who basically is, is, is lobbying for, listen, man, you guys work for us. We, the people, you need to have term limits. And then he rated Congress's approval rating compared to other things in life. And they literally rated like below hemorrhoids. <laughs> I'm seriously, like he listed all these bad things that had a better <laughs> rating than, than Congress. Congress <laughs> beat out lice. That was about it. <laughs> and, he, and this was said on the Senate floor. I thought it was pretty funny, but yeah, I'm sure you I can mean, Google I guess it. that's that's pretty truthful, actually. Like eighty-six percent of America is unhappy with Congress. No kidding. Yeah, well, look, I don't even care what side of the political divide you're on. No, they're me not. Either. They aren't accomplishing anything for anybody's benefit. Period. Right, but they, their own. But their own. Yes, but their own. They have become just, they are completely feckless and worthless, and all they do is cause problems, and it's it's a real it's a real problem, and I don't know, and every time you get anybody that even says anything moderate or reasonable or is willing to compromise, they end up basically getting slayed, you know, in the public. They get killed by the media, they get killed by the public, they get killed by social media. We're in an environment where nothing productive is ever going to be accomplished ever again. It doesn't serve any of our purposes, you know, and um, it's it's very disheartening, to be honest with you. Yep, I'm with you. I'm with you on it. So, Steve, any other cool things you want to let our listeners know? I mean, you, you, you're, yeah. you're really up on social media. I mean, listen... Uh, I'll, I'll publicly address it for you. Anybody out there, just stop peeing, uh, PMing uh, Steve Saga. He will not be answering your uh, PMs anymore. Yes. <laughs> I, I love that because I'm in the same boat. And the best is, look, when there's a real issue that requires, like, maybe my involvement, I love getting a PM, right? Because I want to solve it. I got guys sending me movie themes. I got, you know, just blatant like out of the blue like weird questions so yeah. i can only imagine <laughs> what, what your what feet store is like. can buy this from what's the difference between the corona grande and the short church so, yeah like, you know when is such and such going to be released why didn't my retailer get this but he got that why is the cigar cost three dollars more here than at that <laughs> store it is just it's relentless and, and the thing is i and the problem is there's so much of it that you then lose track of somebody that look I don't make perfect cigars. They're handmade. They're going to be prime. Right. We warrant right. cigar. I want consumers that have a problem to be able to get a hold of me so I can make that problem better. And the problem is there's so much of it that it gets lost. And the thing is, I made that statement today, and I already had people beating up on me that I was just being an egomaniac. You know, I mean, I was just trying nah. to – I'm just trying to let people know that I really want to pay attention, but it's getting to the point that it's not possible. And this is partly because of COVID. So many people are at home. Right. So many people aren't working. So the level of it has increased dramatically yeah. the last 90 days compared to normal. I'm sure when things get back to normal, it'll go a little better. And the other thing, too, is I've been doing this as a – I've been doing it the same as you guys do it. And I mean everybody in the audience. I got no social media team. I got no special skills. I'm just using the apps like every every other Joe. I need to hire a professional to help me out to make it better. And that's on me. So I'm going to try to find someone that can help me do it. But I, I don't want somebody that's going to help me get followers. I don't want someone that's going to help me generate content. I just want someone to make it where I'm not getting PMs and DMs from four different platforms and they're all their own separate apps. And depending on whether they're a follower or a friend, they go to different places in those apps. It's just, it's too much. And you miss stuff. And then you just end up looking like a total dick because you don't reply to people. And it's not what I want. You know, I mean, I really genuinely do want to take care of things. So um, I even forgot the question, Abe. You set me off. (laughs) Oh, what else am I doing? Um, Look, we're adding two sizes to Tricky Traka. Tricky Traka has been really popular. So we're adding uh we're adding a Toro size, which kind of makes sense. I should have done that first, right? The number one selling size. Why right. don't you that? And then we're also adding a a big one, a seven by sixty-four. 
Um, and me, K. Rita, Graham Buffaloes are like super, super popular. So we're going to add that format to Tricky Traka also. Um, I have a project for uh, Smoke In. I'm doing a, a new variation of the Red Meat Lovers that I'm really excited about. You know, the current one, 6x56 is kind of a big, almost a Gordo. But this one is a 6x52 uh, box press. So it feels a little bit more like a 6x50. And the Red Meat Lovers blend, I really love the way it smokes in this size. I, I actually... I like it better than the other one. I know I'm probably not supposed to say that, but I think I think this one is going to be – this one's more in a size that I would smoke every day for me personally. So Evan, Evan Darnell likes to call it meat box pressed. The meat yeah. Box, yeah. Yes. M- MVP, like he, he's coining the phrase. He's hashtagging it to me all the time. Meat box press. He, he's on right now. He's he's all excited. I know he is. I'm it. pretty sure. But no, we're, 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 we're pretty It's going to be a good one. It. And I think this one's going to sell out super fast. I mean, the first release of Red Meat sold out super fast. And then we really, like, what? We tripled the production for the second one? Yeah, we, we, we amped it up a lot. We amped it up a lot. And I think those are almost all gone at this point. I think uh, maybe like 20 or 30 left last I looked. Because we, 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 you know, we, with your uh, approval, we made those awesome cutting boards, which everybody, I've seen them all over social media. They did the Sasquatch. Uh, I bought one. Hashtag Saka Squatch cutting board, yes. I haven't gotten my cigars yet, by the way. I, I'm, I will be filing a customer service complaint. <laughs> I've got so, a guy for that. Um, PM Abe. Yeah, PM Abe. PM Abe. PM Abe. Um, but this next one, I think we're, I don't even remember how many we made, Abe, but it's a significantly lower quantity. Yeah. And, uh, it's closer to the original, the original run. Right. And uh, so I'm really excited about that. Um, Is it a different some- blend? I'm sorry if you said that. No, it's, it, no, it's it's the red meat lovers blend, but it's been adjusted to work for the size, okay, for the size, and not just the size, but also with the press. Mm-hmm. So okay. even though the consumers are going to get the taste correlation between the two, it's definitely a, a different smoking experience. Right, right. You know, what I mean, it's probably if I had to say, I find it a little bit fuller. You know, a little bit, uh, a little bit more brassy. Um, I really, I really like it. So I'm, I'm jazzed about that. And look, we'll have some other little things here and there. I don't want to, I don't want to put the cart before the horse. You know, there's no reason to really talk about a lot of stuff until you're really ready to sell it. You know, we all, we all have the minds of hamsters. We can't keep these thoughts in our head. So, you know, some other things like, uh, you know, Charlie at Half Wheel, he's always like asking for information on what's new, and I always tell him no. Let me get ready to sell first. <laughs> and then he writes something about it anyways. You know what I mean? Even though there's no price, no picture, no details. Like, I don't blame the guy. He's doing what his job is. You know what I mean? He's, you know, but at the same time, I, I don't like to, I don't like to take the focus off what is actually available to buy. Right. Why get consumer, why get consumers talking about what's going to be next year? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it, does, it doesn't help the retailer. It doesn't help the company. It just, you know, it's just wasting a lot of air and answering questions about something that is still in look. Things may, who knows what happens with this substantial equivalency thing. Maybe the stuff I'm planning for next year won't even be allowed. Right. You know, we, there's no way to really know. So until we get beyond that deadline. You, you think, you think, uh, you think if you have to hit the road again, like you used to, and all these stops so will be like doing it again for the first time. Like, are you out of conditioning to be a road warrior now after all this uh, home time? I went into 2020 already knowing I was going to do less because wow. in 2019, yeah, I, was, I was only home like 70 nights the entire year. And that's that's not sustainable. Look, if if my only job was to go out and promote the brand and interact with consumers, fine. But I mean, I really am the cigar guy. I really am the tobacco guy. I really am the guy, you know, running the small little family company. Uh, you know, I'm the graphic designer. I'm everything. So it's not feasible. So even when this lifts, I'm going to have to be a little more judicious. But at the same time, look, I'm eager to do it because I do miss doing events. I do. But I'm going to be more selective. I'm going to do more real events. And what I mean by that, less normal sales events, you know, events that have themes, that have an experience, something going right. on. Right. You know I mean, make it make it something better. 
you know, for for everybody. I'm I'm trying to see I'm trying to see who's going to be the first one to do an event because they just all seem to keep being postponed. Well, I can tell you, I had all my at this point, all my events through the month of September have been canceled. Wow. Um, the barn smokers have been canceled through November. Yeah. Every yeah. every month. Uh, I heard. I heard they're contemplating whether or not they're going to have TPE in January. Um, you know, I was on a conference. They actually have been soliciting the exhibitors on one-on-one conference calls. So I actually spoke to them just this last week. Um, they feel as though they're going to be able to do it. They, they, they're planning that it's going to happen. Um, but at the same time, they're also going to draft a statement letting everyone know that if it doesn't happen, they can get a refund for, you know, their investment. Whereas with the PCA, they won't give you a refund. They're basically rolling the money over for next year's trade show, you know. So, um, look, if the show, if the TPE happens, it's going to be a wildly popular show. Because, I mean, this year we, we lost TAA, we lost PCA, and we lost the International Dortmund Show. So that's three major trade shows that most manufacturers didn't get to do. And, look, that has a real impact on your business and how much you sell and how you sell it and who you sell it to. So if TPE really goes off on schedule at the end of January, I think that those guys are going to be huge winners in the trade show lottery. Or do you think that people may not show up still, even though it's, it's deemed safe to travel? That would be my question. Look, we're, we're humans. We like to interact. We like to be around other people. I mean, I've always been of the belief you don't go to the trade show for the deals for a long, long time. Um, I've always looked at the trade. Look, even me personally, when I'm at the trade show, the big PCA trade show, the IPCPR, I write no orders. I spend my whole time talking to media. Right. Okay. I look at it as a a media availability thing. Literally, my schedule packed every day with eight media visits in the booth. So I can talk about what's new and talk about the company because I know so many other people are going to hear it. So I never looked at the trade show as a this is where you generate revenue. Now, it is, but it was never my primary focus for right. me personally. Um, so and I think that a lot of people that go to the trade show, they go because they like the interaction. They like talking to other retailers. They like the experience of interacting with the manufacturers because we all know you can get the deals from your desk in your home shop. You don't have to go to the trade show. And you haven't had to go to the trade show for over a decade now. And, you know, that genie's not getting stuffed back in the bottle. So yeah. I think there will be enough people that the very first trade show, whatever it may be, is going to be wildly popular. Even if 50% of the people say, I'm still leery to travel, if you get 50% of the people to come, that'll be the biggest trade show we've had since the boom. I mean, it'll be huge. Yeah, everybody's going to want to get out, I guess, and and see other people in the industry and interact. I mean, even the little bit of interaction that we've had here, because we were we were secluded at home. Now that we're up here, I mean, just seeing our family, it's it it feels. I mean, it's not normal, but it feels normal again just to be around people, even if it's in the backyard and and staying distant from them. There's just something to be said. The kids behave better when they when they get fresh people. I behave better when I see fresh people. You know, it's, I, I can see that. That sounded like the same statement. The kids and me? Yeah. My wife, my wife usually puts it, puts it that way, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a very uh, uh, interesting next year, year and a half. Don't know. I mean, we're, we're having our own, you know, debates on how we're going to handle February for, you know, the great smoke. Uh, we we're, we're looking at options and possibilities and how to, to do a over-the-top virtual event if it doesn't go pan through. And, you know, at some point, we're just going to have to make a hard decision on which way we're going to go. But, man, we're, 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 we're not at a high confidence level that we'll even be able to pull off the big smoke in February, mid-February. Right. That's, that's crazy. I mean, I don't want to be the first guy to hold a mega event, right? I mean, I just, you know, I mean, I'm a little hesitant. You know, I want to. Well, actually, Abe, I think I think you would be the way things are going because Texas Cigar Festival was in canceled, Rocky Mountain Festival was in canceled. So you actually would. I don't think Stogies is doing their event in Houston. So I think you would actually be the first big retailer event on the normal calendar. If if, if we have it, right? If we have if, it, 
if you have it. Yeah, what does the I, venue I, I, say? As, as well, far as the venue's concerned, they're ready to go, right? We had a contract, we had a contract, right? And the contract was, um, you know, we had a date and everything. And normally, like, when we once we get all the details set, and what the contract's supposed to say, I usually get it within a week. It's been like, you know, two or three months. And we know part of it was everybody was closed and whatnot. But then they came back to us and they said, well, um, legal is now implementing some new pandemic language into the contract. And uh, we still haven't gotten it. So you know, I don't even think they know how to write the contract at this point. Well, that, that's probably what they're half figuring out is what kind of verbiage and language you're going to use is going to be acceptable. So, um I mean, look, we're going we're gonna to be prepared either way. You know, I'd feel more comfortable if, if I saw people dipping their toes in the water and seeing right. what kind of reaction goes on. And, and, and if, if we get an overwhelming response and feel it can be done somewhat safe, we may throw it off. But if we don't, I, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make it a pretty still unique experience, even if we have to do it virtually. So, I mean, we're already working on those options and ideas and what to come up with and how to do it. So... It's going to be a very interesting landscape the next uh, 18 to 24 months. I can say that retailers who normally have an annual event, there are a few that have some still scheduled for September, October. And normally when they put the tickets online to purchase, they sell out within a day. And this year they did not. You know, they sold about half as many as quick as they normally do. And then the other half... I think there's still some tickets available for some events that you would have assumed would have just gone out the door instantly, and they always have in the past. So there's definitely right. a reluctance by a, a certain number of consumers to commit to these events, which normally they wouldn't hesitate at all. And uh, right. and so and it's hard to gauge that. And as Abe will tell you, if you're planning the Great Smoke and only half the people come, he's got a problem. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's going to go bankrupt. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, you need you need a certain attendance level to make these events even happen, you know. Yeah, just, break even. Just to break even, exactly. Yeah. So, it's 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 definitely look. Like I said, 2019 is just a messed up year, and or 2020 is a messed up year. So I can't keep track of the years. And yeah, <laughs> I'll take 2019 back any day. Yeah. yeah. So I, it's it's really hard to gauge. It really is. I mean, your event, Abe, Great Smoke, was one of the last big ones I did. I only did two events after yours before everything just instantly got canceled. Yeah. Like, under. I mean, it's we got lucky. We got lucky. We really did. Maybe it was ground zero. Maybe you're the reason there is a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know that's going to be like all over social media now. <laughs> of course. Always, hey, look, at least your company isn't named Corona like Jeff. Imagine how he feels. <laughs> I, think, I think Jeff's been pushing the tagline of Chinese virus higher than anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Him and Tanya are watching right now. I'm waiting for Tanya to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Love <She's>... you, T. <laughs> That's true. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't even think about that. That's tough. Oh, yeah. He made posts about it. You know, he refused to call it coronavirus. Yeah. I don't blame him. And look, you, you say that's kind of stupid and silly, but, you know, what clicks in people's back of their head subconsciously, man, it's hard to tell sometimes, you know? And uh, so... Well, I mean, listen, your company name is something like a child to you, so now yeah. for it to get attached to something that everybody's talking about and not the most positive light, I don't blame them. Right. I don't blame uh, them. Uh, 100%. Uh, and with that, hey, let's bring in our very special guest, Mr. Joe Groh from Drew Estate Cigars. Well, hold on is a second. That time? He's not he's not on yet, but he's coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you texted me, he's ready. I, I did, but when you see him come on the call, that means you're ready to introduce him. <laughs> uh, but I figured that was you ready to launch him in. I'm, I'm calling him in. We try to get him... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, well, we have anyways, to get him connected while and all. While you're getting Joe Groves on, listen, we had a great uh, social media campaign that involved um, using a beach ball, you know, notifying the start of summer, the Drew Estate Cigar, and, and we got a great prize package, which consists of, and I'm going by memory now, an awesome Yeti cooler by Drew Estate. It's got a beautiful logo on top. You got a beautiful, uh, bright yellow, you'd see it anywhere on the beach, uh, barbecue grill from Twisted Tea, the fine folks over at Twisted Tea. 
uh, included, I think, is a Drew Estate Toolkit and a bundle of the original 2014 commemorative uh, Dojo Edition Dogmas by Drew Estate. This is one of this is from the original first release. That's all going to be given away. Guys posted some great pictures. I mean, there were some really awesome pictures. I'm sure Joe will tell you about them. Uh, we picked out 10 finalists. We sent it over to Joe. And now Joe's going to be picking the lucky winner. Joe, thanks for taking time on your Saturday and joining us. Abe, I'm starting to feel like a regular. I think this is like my third appearance in uh, you know, a month and a half. So I'm enjoying it. <laughs> we like That's- it. We like it. We're uh, very thanks. happy to have you back. Thanks for being in. Thanks, guys. How's everybody been today? Everybody having a good Saturday? Yes. yes, So we've had some, I think we had some tremendous entries this month. I mean, Abe, you and I were texting back and forth some of the ones we saw, and they were just, I mean, they were hilarious. So you guys sent me over some finalists. I want to share, you know, there's a, we got to, we got to definitely have a good winner. It's a solid picture. And I mean, I was laughing on all these, but I want to share a couple just so people get an idea of what we got going Honor, well, at least one honorable mention, and then we'll just do the winner. We don't want to draw this out too long. So oh, let me yeah. share my screen. So let's – there's a nice, lovely picture from Wes here that I – can you guys see that? Uh, kind of. We, we cannot, actually. We can only see the hands. Yeah, the hands, the hands and the beach ball. Yeah, but oh. this, this, was, this, was, this, one, this one blew me away. This was uh, – I got this it. This was – it's a – you got it, Paul? Yeah. Okay. All right, there you go. So you got it was a hilarious photo, but Wes, uh, you know, I was just dying with this one. It was it was making me laugh. But now we're gonna go to the winner here. Just I think out of sheer creativity, just uh, building this little man with the grill. You know, David Wolf, you are the winner, sir. I think you wow. deserve a grill for this. Just putting this together, the sheer just it was pure creative. I loved it. Putting the beach ball in, it's perfect for summer. We're ready to grill. Yeah, you know, you're going to enjoy that bundle of OG dogma. And I think that's just, it was tremendous effort. I mean, these are some great photos. So let me get out of sharing for a minute. Yeah, we'll post them on the Facebook page. The winner yeah, make sure and, to send uh, them the to honorable message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. I have, I have them. I have them. We'll post okay. them up. We'll post them up. But that's awesome. That's a hell of a prize package. And uh, who was the winner for, again? Uh, Dave. Yeah, he's on right now. Dave Wolf. He said, you guys are freaking awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations, David Wolf, winner of that fantastic Drew Estate prize package in a Twisted Tea Grill. Joe, I think I we lost. might be losing you, buddy. Yeah, as we say, I lost sound. But, yeah, I lost. but, but thank yeah. you, Joe, for coming on. Thanks, and, Joe. Well, thank we'll you, see Joe. him again soon. He's beca- like he said, he's becoming a uh, he's becoming a regular on the show. <laughs> Yeah, we'll probably have them on before, you know, they're, they're doing the big, uh, you know, we talk about dogma, we've given away dogma. Um, the newest variation of dogma, the sun-grown dogma, is being released next month, and we're doing a huge virtual release party with the cigar, and, and the packaging and the cigar looks, the cigar looks amazing in the photography. No one sent me any, so I haven't been able to try the cigar yet. You know, hint, hint, hint. hint. And it's really funny because we, we did a smoke in virtual lounge with Pedro Gomez, and, and every time I'm on with Pedro or even Master, they're smoking them away. I'm like, it'd be nice if someone would send me a couple, I could smoke it, uh, you know, on the air. But uh, we'll, hopefully, we'll get some soon. But yeah, we'll probably have Joe on a couple weeks before that dogma release, so that'll be interesting. I gotta get on the virtual lounge again from from up here. I got a nice giant. I got two nice giant backyards that I can uh, smoke cigars in. So I always have fun on there when I get on. We had yeah. Jesse. We had Jesse Flores and Pedro Gomez on the other night. It was actually pretty cool. Oh, very nice. That's pretty awesome. Jesse's a, Jesse's Jesse's an interesting dude. Adam, have you ever been in the virtual lounge? No. Why not? <laughs> that, that that would involve socializing. Adam's never been in the real lounge. Yeah. Come on, with a day drinking, how's he gonna survive that long? <laughs> That's hilarious! Wow, Thanks. even Steve appreciate called it. you out. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, yes. Anyway, now joining us from uh, the hills of North Carolina, and uh, sitting in his parlor, Mr. William Cooper. Oh, is it a parlor day? It's a virtual parlor. But I don't see you, Coop. Yeah, Coop, where'd you yeah. go, buddy? 
you got the camera the wrong direction, Coop. Oh, there oh right. yeah. Oh, oh magic. It's the virtual parlor. Ooh, oh, okay. ooh, it's magic. He's in the garage again. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good well, morning. Nice, uh, nice photo setup you got there, Coop. Oh, thank you, thank you. Good morning, Steve. How's it going? Good morning, everybody. Coop Loop, what's happening this week, buddy? Well, you know, actually, one year ago, it was a. We were just on the eve of the trade show opening. What would it would have been today. It would have been the oh. day before the trade show opened. This week's been almost dead for news. There has been some, but it, it has been incredibly slow for a last week of June. Yeah, normally you'd be inundated with a lot of trade show stuff right now, and it's just not happening. Yeah, yeah. I, saw you, I saw you posted this week that it seemed like companies weren't coming out with stuff or giving announcements, and there was like a deadlock or just a quietness. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely slower. There's definitely companies holding back stuff. They don't, because there's not this um, rush that I, oh, I have to get something out by, announced by July, because... You know, obviously, I'm going to be displaying this stuff in July. So there isn't that kind of push that we've seen in, in recent years. I mean, that we've seen in recent years where everyone wants to get their stuff announced before the trade show. So it's companies that maybe had some stuff in progress right now that they're just starting to announce. I think we're going to see it more spread out this summer. Okay. Interesting. Well, so now Abe wants to talk to you about something, right, Abe? Or do you want him to finish the news? Well, I just wanted to ask him about because, look, I mean, look, I mean, uh, uh, Jeff and Rocky and Greg and a bunch of guys we had this night, you know, this this um, Zoom uh, enthusiasts uh, with Trump Jr. and um, I, I thought it would be a great opportunity to see maybe and, and 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 voice our opinion as far as what we're going through in the cigar industry um, with that. I registered. You had, it was one of those things you had to register to yeah. go listen to. So I went to go start the process, but then when I saw all the personal data, especially giving my cell phone number, as I'm like, yeah. I already, my phone already gets blown up enough, so I ended up not putting it through. But Coop was there, and I saw him, had him a post uh, that day, the day of it. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, when you put a post up with anything related to politics or the president these days, you, you got to know it's just going to cause a firestorm. And, and that wasn't what my intent was, but I should have known better. Um. So I, I also was aware of this, right? And what you described, Abe, really wasn't what this turned out to be, right? So this was something that was put on by the Trump campaign, which is, I think, different than, let's say, having a town hall meeting with maybe like Rudy Giuliani or something like that. But you want to know what's interesting? Right. I'm going to tell you something interesting because I just show you how you psychologically – when I, I'd seen this scroll over social media prior, right? And psychologically, I don't know why, but I walked, I kept walking away with the impression that this was like, oh, this was us as a cigar community bending the ear of, 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 of Trump Jr. to talk about our, our woes, our concerns with our future, right? And then after your post, I went and looked at it again. It, it doesn't say that anywhere on there. Right. That was, right. But, so right. there was no there was no misleading. I just I personally like saw what I wanted to see right. when I read it, and then later on looked at it like, oh, this doesn't mention anything, anything about FDA on here. But for some reason, I had walked away with that impression the first couple times I saw it. It's weird. We we did too. I mean, I did too because remember, as a cigar community, right? We're spoiled where. A lot of us, we get on these types of things, these, these town halls, these V-herbs, and a lot of people get access to these type of people for you know names in the industry that maybe in other industries or other walks of life you don't get access to like that. So I think it was natural for a lot of us to kind of make an assumption like that was what was going to be. This really wasn't what it was going to be. Um, what it was, it was the Trump campaign looking to have some sort of um, off-the-record input on the topic of cigars. And when the meeting started, um, the moderator gets on it, and within the first minute, he asks the media to leave. He, and I, I, I kind of absorbed that for about another minute, and I'm like, they don't want me here. So I left. 
right? Um, now, did they ask you to leave, or did they ask you not to write about it? They asked the media to leave. Hmm. Because they didn't want the media writing about it. Okay. Right? They didn't want this was an off the record conversation, and they did not want that that conversation to be broadcast over the airwaves or, 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 or you know written or whatever blog or whatever you want to call it. Now I'm going to be honest. My whole intent of being in that meeting was not to wow get get to see you know, Donald Trump smoking Junior smoking a cigar. Mine was to assess right and observe what the cigar industry's connection was with the Trump campaign. That that was my whole purpose of being there. It wasn't to in, to get caught up in the moment or anything like that. That was what I was going to do. Me staying in that meeting would have immediately put me in a compromising position because that was my whole intent of being in the meeting. Um, I have done in the past with, with politicians, written and observed and assessed our relationship with politicians. Go back to Rudy Giuliani. Um, I was very critical that I felt the industry did not have a connection with Rudy Giuliani and it was being made out to be that there was this Rudy was going to save the industry, blah, blah, blah. I wrote about that. My goal, again, was to see how – was well, were we really connected with this campaign? That was what I was looking for. Um, well, I mean, the, our industry – and, you know, look, it's constantly expansive, right? Right. I've been, I've been at 25 years, and the community that I've con- continually been exposed to, the, I think the majority of the people kind of tend to be more – whether it's Trump in office or whoever in office – tends to be more conservative, right? I mean, obviously the base is growing and there's more bipartisan people who are enjoying the lifestyle, which honestly, for the most part, I mean, I, I know I know in my shops where it used to be really staunchly, you know, mostly conservative people, there is a huge now bipartisanship. And it's awesome to see at least in a cigar shop, everybody could talk normal, right? It's like when you get on social media, everybody becomes like flaming warriors and, you know, I can't tolerate a single word, but I've heard conversations. None of it's ever gotten out of control in, in our lounges or anything. Mm, yeah, but you've seen on social media what's happened, right? With the keyboard. Yeah, I mean, I had to delete about I had to delete about ten posts off off that comment because it immediately started this polarizing feud. I all I said on that post is I was disappointed that I didn't get an opportunity to do what I did. I didn't criticize anyone in the industry. I didn't criticize anyone in the Trump campaign. I was just disappointed that this wasn't what I, you know, I was expecting. I didn't go into Abe expecting to ask Donald Trump Jr. questions about right, right, right. about. Well, I, I, I think, go there as a I press think conference. Also, I think you're also confused because you were asked to come and then all of a sudden asked to leave. But I was telling Coop when we were talking earlier week. I said, look, I, I'm pretty sure the guys in the cigar industry who wanted Coop to be there and asked him to be there, whatnot. This wasn't probably something they thought of, and I'm pretty sure it, was, it very well possibly came up at the last minute where they're all getting ready to start this thing, and someone's saying, yeah, you know, we've we invited some great people from our industry, you know, so a couple of media guys, and they went, what, what, what? No, 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 there can't be any media. And that was probably something can they literally I, got popped out here? at the last minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're on. Part, part of this is I think there's some confusion First off, it definitely wasn't a discussion about the FDA. You can't even have a lot of those conversations related to a Trump campaign event about the FDA because there can't be any sort of simple, hey, you're not doing enough for us. You need to do this to get my vote. There's a lot of legal requirements that are necessary that the average person – and look, I understand there were a couple manufacturers in that meeting that ended up asking some questions – that really, you're not allowed to have that question even raised. There's a lot of implications of this. Yep. So I think part of it was a little bit of ignorance, a little bit of miscommunication. It really, and it's not that those people that were in the room don't know how we feel as an industry. It was really just, it was more so a campaign style event. That's what it was. It wasn't a panel discussion on the FDA. It was really were just- you, kind of, Were you on the on the- no, I, I wasn't. I was invited to join, and um, and they were very nice to ask me to be on the panel. And I talked with the campaign officials about it in a meeting. And when I came clear to me that we couldn't have the type of conversations that I would want to have, I just simply said, "Hey guys, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be on the panel because I can't contribute to this." Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but it, I think there's definitely some. Conf- 
fusion. And I don't think that they sold it in one way. I think what Coop said about the perception being this yeah. based on your own internal perceptions. And a part of that comes out of ignorance, too. And when I say ignorance, I don't mean that in a bad way, because right. right. I didn't start getting involved with senators and congressmen and politically until the S chip thing came up. There's a lot of weird little things about what you can say in certain places at certain times on certain topics that have real legal impact. So I think they would have, and I think they could have even phrased it better to Coop. I think they were okay with Coop being there, okay? I just think they were saying, hey, this has to be an off the record, not a media style event. And I know some media guys stayed in the channel is my understanding, yep. and they just kept it off the record. I don't think they were trying to single out Coop or any of the other bloggers, but I don't think they I don't think they realized that there were gonna be media in the channel either. So I think, they, I think they got caught off guard just as much as Coop got caught off yeah. guard. It really yeah. was meant to be a discussion about cigars and the lifestyle and, you know, hey, what do you like to smoke so-and-so? And, and not only were cigar people in that channel, something Coop may not be aware of, but the Altria folks were listening in on that channel too. You know what I mean? Big Tobacco was also part of the group that was in the circle. So it was a combination of a lot of people around, around the whole tobacco topic, but it really was more of a campaign style affair and not, not an FDA panel discussion. It really wasn't. Oh, absolutely. And then, like I said, I, it was never marketed as such. Man, I just swear that psychologically and mentally, the first time I looked at it, that that's what I got from it. Yeah. Like I got, I got like a little excited. I'm like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And, and, then, and I have you to know, add one more thing to this. This situation with I want to I want to say something to the listeners. Regardless of what your political beliefs are, how you feel about Trump, how you feel about Biden, how you feel about whoever. We, as an industry, have to deal with all politicians on all sides of the aisle at all times. I personally have actually spent more time in the office of Democratic senators and congressmen than I have of Republican congressmen and senators. Okay, you cannot you cannot take a tribalistic point of view at this situation and think you're going to get something accomplished. So it is necessary for us in the industry to engage with the Trump administration. It's necessary for us to engage with Nancy Pelosi. It's necessary for us to engage, just like we used to engage with Harry Reid when he was the Senate Majority Leader. You have to, you have no choice. If we don't do that, then we're not doing what's in the best interest of our industry and as a byproduct, our consumers. So people going, well, wow, he was in the Trump thing. I'm not gonna smoke his cigars anymore. He's a Trumper. You really, I guarantee you, Rocky Patel is not any less engaged with Trump than he is with the Democratic side of the aisle. Okay, you have to. In do fact, that. in fact, even more so the Democratic side of the aisle, probably. Look, a lot of. I mean, look at the supporters of the exemption bill out of Florida. I mean, there's just as many. There's actually more Democrats than I think Republicans. I mean, many of our biggest supporters have been Democratic senators and congressmen. I you think know. people lose sight of working towards what's best for an industry uh, being something completely different than your political views of either the person in office or how you lean. One has nothing to do with the other. No matter which way you lean or what your personal views are, you have to work with whoever's in office to help pass things or protect your livelihood and your business. So oh, you yeah. have to. You have to engage with everybody. And as soon as you start not, you might as well just hang up your spurs because there's no hope at all. And that's no. one of the, and that's one of the things that I find rather sad when I see the way the discussions have gone on social media and they keep heightening up as we near the presidential election. I don't think consumers are really thinking it through. They just kind of are putting you in a box. And we can't we can't operate in that box. It's not good for our industry, it's not good for our customers, it's not good for our retailers. And it's something that everybody needs to understand that engaging with someone doesn't mean you agree with everything they say. Yeah. And the other thing, Steve's 100 percent right on this. And let's not forget, this is not a bad thing that our industry is engaging with a campaign. Like I yeah. said, this is a very good thing for our industry, regardless of who that campaign is, regardless of the campaign. And so. That's what I'm saying. This I I didn't say this was a bad thing. I didn't feel I was mistreated or anything. It was just I was disappointed right. that we, I didn't get that opportunity. That was it. Right. Well, society society in general has become just so short sighted, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you know, 
at, at the uh, Red Meat Lovers Club dinner, you know, Mayor Giuliani was a guest there. And, and, and the amount of posts of people who didn't like Giuliani and said they would never eat the... I mean, let me tell you something. I, I, I did not vote for Barack Obama, right? Wasn't a fan of a lot of his policies. But holy cow, man, if that guy showed up at my great sure. dinner, I would pull up a seat and, be, oh, and, and, and hope I could sit next to him and maybe say five words. Yeah. yeah he's president isn't of the United the, States. Isn't that one of the beauties of cigars is it allows you to interact with people that aren't in your normal socio-economical political circle. It's one of the things that makes cigar smoking so enjoyable. It's a common shared bond regardless of race, religion, economics, politics. Absolutely. and. And I think that uh, yeah. I, I don't know, it's a byproduct of the current moment. I just wish everyone would just dial it down just a little tiny bit. I'll dial it down a lot. I mean, it just, it, it's it's overwhelming. It off. <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, I think like Bernie Sanders is off his rockers, man. But if he showed up, I'd be excited. I want to know what flavor of Kush he's smoking recently. <laughs> seriously, I mean, I would sit down and I would want to have that conversation with him. Even though I don't politically agree with this guy on anything, I would love to sit down and have that conversation with him. Yeah, you know, Abe, remember when Jeff Borshowitz, I guess, met with the vice president, right? He did, I, you know, Jeff, he doesn't agree probably with a lot of what the Biden campaign would have um, when he was vice president, or certainly now, but. I guess you know Jeff was still it was still kind of a big moment for him to meet the vice president of the United States, his kids to meet the vice president of the United States. And what happened? People just started really blasting him, which was like, really, this is you have a chance to meet the vice president. That was terrible what they did to him on that. I don't know why everything just taken to another level. It really is. Yeah. So. So that's what I had to deal with this week. It was, uh, and my phone blew up needless after, and I should have known better is what I'm saying. But, um, but I would have done it again. If, if, if I would, you know, again, if that's the type of thing, I'm not really that interested in being a part of, of that for what I'd be looking to do there. Because again, I'm, I'm kind of trying to write about something here, not, not, uh, just, you know, have a smoke and hear things like that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a strange, strange world, but Hey, all fun and games. Um, anything else going on in the news this week, Coop? Um, there were, like I said, there were a few things that were announced this week. Um, there's a new Henry Clay cigar coming out uh, from Altidus. Uh, it's called the Henry Clay Warhawk uh, Rebellious. And uh, this is kind of a unique one because it's the first Henry Clay cigar being made in Nicaragua. It's being made by A.J. Fernandez. A.J. Fernandez? Yeah. Go yep. yeah. So that's, that's the next one. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> right, Thanks. and it's the and it's the first Henry Clay that's not going to have any sort of broadleaf in it, which is a little odd because that's oh Henry Clay is a brand you always associate with broadleaf, whether it's a wrapper. Well, or that, that could be the name why we're rebellious. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, it kind of makes some sense, I guess, if you want to market it that way. Um, but it, it's it, like I said, it's still it's an interest. Well, Henry Clay is a brand that Altidus has been giving a lot of love to the last three or four years right now. Um, so this is the latest installment that they had. And the Connecticut Shade they did last year, which did have Broadleaf as a binder, did pretty well for them last year. So I can understand them trying to do this right now. Is this going to be another limited run? Yes, this one is a limited run. Mm -hmm. So uh, 1,220 count boxes, uh, one size, a 6x54 Toro. Hmm. Interesting. We have a listener question for you, Coop. Okay. In interrupting your, your new story. Uh, Tanya is asking, is it true that Dylan uh, is gone from Davidoff? That oh. maybe, I have not heard that. Wow. Oh. What? That is that she, is the rumor right just, now. I know you don't do rumors. the bombshell. Wow, I did not notice. Um, yeah, I have not seen anything on this this morning. That that would be a big bombshell. They they have to do some uh, looking into that. I, I if that is, I'm I'm not aware of it. As of right now, it's a it's a rumor. She's she's asking if it's if it's true or not. You know, we need, start, kind of, we need yeah. to start a new segment called the Tale with Tanya. You know, yeah. Do you know the, years ago when like Charlie Minato was starting out at Half Wheel? I think he reported a story that Dylan Austin got fired from Camacho, and it turned out not to be true. Ooh. So <laughs> I'm not going to be the second one to do that. I got I have to do a little investigating on that. Rumor, rumor free. Rumor wow. Free. 
free, buddy. We free. never. We, we, they always want us to find out when like there's a new sales rep getting hired or something like. Which I don't understand how that's news. Like that. You're hiring I don't even a know how that's relevant. Uh, yeah. I, believe me, I get a lot of those. Like we hired a broker uh, to cover like Arkansas or something. It's not really newsworthy in a lot of ways. But when someone gets fired, no one wants to talk about it because no one gets fired in the cigar industry. Well, right. this is not a broker, too. I mean, this is the president of Dallas yeah. USA. So, oh, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. There's, um, there's a lot of rumors popping up on the chat feed that I, I won't share right now as to where he is or what he's doing. But Oh, no, I have to read this. Just for the record, right now I'm touching up my resume, so bear with me, guys. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the insider baseball stuff that Steve doesn't like. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's a paying gig, you know? <laughs> Maybe Davidoff is a fat white dude, you know? <laughs> is there anything else going on this week, Coop? Um, like I said, pretty quiet week. There's like, just another couple of things out of Alta's Rome, a new Romeo by Romeo Julieta size is a six by 60 that's coming out with that. And uh, finally, out of uh, Mombacho, Claudio Roy's uh, company has announced the Coseca 2015 release featuring uh, tobaccos from a 2015 vintage. So all the tobaccos there are from that 2015 vintage. And that was it news-wise this week. Wow. Well, hopefully, uh, since we got two weeks uh, till the next time we talk to you, hopefully there'll be some good stuff. You got any big plans for the 4th of July, Coop? Um, I'm hoping I can go out somewhere here right now. Um, it's get you know, like, I'm not sure what North Carolina, I, I know Florida is getting crazy right now. Your, your sure state is considered North- one of the top 10 uh, worst scenarios right now. North Carolina and South Carolina are in bad times right now. South can, I give you, can I give you a piece of advice? Stop listening to anything coming off across the news. Seriously, well, I have. I don't listen. As soon as I, I don't listen to nothing. Nothing. Well, yeah, you're right. And, um, like, I don't pay attention to the numbers because they're meaningless. But if I hear, hey, certain things are not opening up now till July 17th in North Carolina, that's where I pay a little attention. Yeah, to the regulations, right? Cause, but but I, I don't care about these numbers and curves. They're, they're meaningless. But, 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 but see, here's the problem with that, Coop, right? They passed a, 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 a mandatory mask law, right? The media went out and posted that this was effective through the end of the year, right? Then the documents came out from the government that said that this ordinance is in effect until July 20, June 25th or July 25th. Or it was going to be like three weeks, right? Three or four weeks. And then, and then, and then you know, it could be extended if needed. And then... They passed, they, the media all blasted social media and the news and television with the bars are closing up in Florida. All the bars are closing up in Florida. Well, the documents came from, you know, the, 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 the legislators. Yeah. Right. It was only bars that derived more than 50% of their business from liquor. That's a huge difference, man. Right? That's why you just can't yeah. listen to it anymore. It's just everybody's so, they're skewing everything. They're lying about everything. They're sometimes purposely and then sometimes inadvertently misinforming everybody. So what are you supposed to listen to? I just stop listening. It, it, it's so that that affects you, right? Because if it's fifty percent, you, yeah, man. We, right. we were so like, that, man, that, that, I just that's got misinformation on your business, is what you're we saying. Just got all our bartenders back, right? In somewhat of a functional form, making a decent living again. Right, and I'm like thinking, man, we're gonna have to shut these guys down again. And then we find out the next morning is, oh, it doesn't affect us. Ruined it's, my day yesterday. Yeah, you gotta I'm do your you, own. I'm t- you gotta do your I'm own tired. research. Yeah, the, it, it's the new true pandemic. It's it's news media. That's the problem. Oh. Media is the virus. Not you, Coop. Oh. No, <laughs> no, I'm I'm not I'm not media, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It's funny you say that because, like Coop said. He posted about his experience in the Trump meetup, and what ends up happening is the replies weren't really based on what Coop was actually writing. Right. They were pouring their own what they their own into the topic. That's the everything is runaway now. It's very it's a very difficult situation. It's all runaway. You know how many times yeah. I've seen a post or something? It's so not political or bipartisan, and man, you go twelve comments in, and all of a sudden it, it's become it turns. political. Yeah. Right. So, Coop, what can we expect on Cigar-Coop.com this week? Um, got a few reviews coming out. If there, um, there's going to be the uh, the Roma Craft Baca's coming this week. 
Um, Law Roar 115 is also scheduled for this week, so stay tuned for that. And uh, on, is Weasel on, Fest still on? Is is yep. is he still holding that? Yeah. yeah. Now what? I mean, I think it's. I don't know what the Texas change mean to him right now. Um, because Texas is one of those states that they're saying. I think Texas right now is considered the the has the highest number of new cases per day. Right, and I think there's some limit on gatherings over a hundred. I heard. I, I, honestly, I I I I'm not saying this to be mean or, or anything. I, I, I think it's kind of really irresponsible to be in the September with everything going on to even being, I mean, is it really worth it? I don't know if the word irresponsible is correct, but I think it's just, it's it might too, not be correct. It's correct just too, top, right too topsy turvy. Yeah. It's very hard to make plans. Uh-huh. Right. I, I was trying to come up with a more adult word than topsy turvy. But, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but topsy turvy is more accurate, right? Uh, you know, I mean, okay, can, can I say maybe not the most responsible thing to do? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just I, a little surprised, to be honest. Well, that's in, that's in September, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean they've been working on this for a long time. I don't want to, you know. And now I understand they're in a tough position with that, um, you know. So I don't know, if, and who knows? Again, we may be hearing information out of Texas that coming from the media that may be correct or incorrect. Right? Now the protocol guys having a pool party, that one was a I, little more head scratching, to be honest. I, I with you. think that honestly, I think that's insane too. I, I, I mean, think look, that one I, was. Yeah, the I mean, timing just, of that announcement just you know, leaves. There's a protocol pool party just so Juan can take pictures of him standing next to hot girls. Let's let's just be honest about it. <laughs> <laughs> protocol Keep pool party. Okay. away from him. Yeah. <laughs> all, he's hilarious. just it's he's just trying to get it, Kim from Schmokini to fly up. Dude, it's all it, it's all Instagram clickbait. That's the whole purpose of that. <laughs> that's hilarious. And God bless you, Juan. We love you for it. But that's <laughs> what it is. Juan, Juan is without a doubt living his best life. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, He's not holding back. Oh, yeah. definitely not. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, Coop. Well, enjoy the Fourth of July holiday, buddy. We will talk to you in two weeks because we're taking the Fourth of July off, which happens uh, to fall on a Saturday, and we're all so excited about that. Oh, good. Thanks you, for telling I, him. I, I heard you were especially him. excited, Adam, for the Fourth of July. For not having a show next Saturday. Yeah, it just means I don't have to come into work. <laughs> wow. The day drinking becomes night drinking, goes into next day drinking. Bingo. Nice. Bingo. Don't call a spade a spade. <laughs> oh, my God. There you go. <laughs> Grant, given, touche. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Saka surrounded by bottles over there. Yeah, send some good stuff, Steve. <laughs> you got my address. Uh. Dude, I have right. so decimated my bar because, I, you know, I'm the guy that drinks one, two, you know, I get a bottle, it lasts me a year, it lasts me two years. I've been just, I have literally consumed probably $10,000 worth of top end spirits in the oh last 90 days. It's crazy. My I liver is the richest liver in the country right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, Steve, you got any big Fourth of July plans or big weekend plans going forward? No, no, we're gonna look. We we always play most of these holidays pretty low key. Um, you know, we may. I gotta talk to. I gotta talk to the boss about it. But we used to do this big Fourth of July fireworks thing. You know, because I have some property, and be, since I started the new company, always the trade show has intervened. Mm-hmm. Now I'm kind of wondering, should we? But then, of course. You've got the the C19 thing, so I don't know if she wants to have 100 people over at the house, you know, doing a barbecue and setting off fireworks and whatnot. So, Well, uh, for the first time since I've lived in Florida, Florida has banned the use of fireworks. Is that true? Yes, but they have not banned the sale of fireworks. (laughs) I'm not bullshitting. Oh, no, I've had people for the last two nights somewhere in my neighborhood lighting fireworks off for the last yeah, two nights banned, in a row. They banned the use of them, but not the sale of them. That's so funny. And then it's like up here in, on Long Island, they're completely illegal, but you know, you can't sell them, you can't use them, but obviously everybody does. They're, they're same here, Adam. Since I've been here at night, people are lighting off fireworks. Uh, well, Coop, thanks for being here, buddy. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Uh, yep. We will talk to you in two weeks, most definitely. Hopefully, we'll have some exciting news and see what's going on in the industry. 
Yep. Yeah, uh, happy too. and safe fourth to everybody. Yep. Take yeah. care. Absolutely. Okay. Steve, thank you for being here as always, buddy. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, for being Sockalicious. Thank you. Say hello to the boss for me. Will do. Absolutely. Uh, to everybody out there in Facebook land, thank you for tuning in to another exciting edition of KMA Talk Radio. Until two weeks from now, hey, keep it lit. Keep it lit, everybody. <laughs>